Welcome, everybody. It's a great occasion uh, for us. We've uh, been waiting for a while to have you here with me. I know your schedule has been crazy, but you are um, one of the pioneers uh, in this area, and uh, we uh, think it's just apt that you're here. It's thank perfect. You. So thank you for being here, and welcome. So just starting on the issue of water doing and uh, your interventions in this field. I wanted to go back to the beginning, you know, to the story at the beginning of all this. You know, of course, we've lived with water and we know water, but at what point did you decide that water is the passion that you want to pursue? Water is the area you want to work in? What drove you to water? Yeah, thanks. And if anyone has heard this story before, and uh, I, I'm really sorry because I'm repeating this often, but I, it's the only truth I have, so I have to repeat it when I'm asked that question. Actually, I started on the foundation to sort of learn the ropes of philanthropy back in 2001. But then in 2003-04, I came into my first real batch of money by the sale of our Infosys shares. And I thought I must put, I didn't need more money in my personal life, so I wanted to put it all into the foundation. But at that time, now 100 crores doesn't sound like much when you think of philanthropy, but at that time it was a sizable amount. And I had to figure out how to use it strategically, because believe me, it's not easy to give money and give well. And so we started researching. My, I hired the CEO, the great uh, Sunita Nadavani, and uh, we said, what should we work on that will make a difference to the people of this country in a small way? Because we knew we were going to be small. Um, and actually, we were looking at health issues and several things. And I must say, even if it sounds cheesy, I was literally in the shower holding water in my hands. And I felt like somebody is knocking me on the head and saying, stupid, it's water that you're going to work on. <laughs> and so I said, oh, really, that makes sense. And then. Immediately, we started researching what's happening in the water sector. Is philanthropic money coming into the sector? Is it having impact? And wow, it was so interesting to find out there was not a single Indian philanthropic foundation uh, in India uh, devoted to water. That the water crisis was beginning to unfold in, in a magnitude that was truly shocking as I went into uh, learning more about it. And uh, that, that really clinched it that whatever we can do in our little way to improve the situation or to spread knowledge, uh, we should, and we're fully committed to it. It's 12 years now. And um, uh, I can uh, tell you a few things if you like at the top. Let me use the correct uh, data. My cheat sheet is here. But, you know, we, it was a very sharp learning curve because we didn't know very much about the water sector. And we had to learn very rapidly. First, we just started experimenting in this, uh, in, you know, getting small grants here and there. But uh, at the end of it, like every foundation does, we move from projects to programs to partnerships. And now, excitingly, we are on our fourth journey, which we can talk about a little later. But just to give you a map of what Albion has been able to do, and when I, when I say Albion has been able to do, I'm very conscious of the fact that we cannot do anything without our partners, and I really do that. Uh, we are a funding organization, but we also come with passion and commitment, and we certainly try to uh, help our partners when they ask for that help to strategize and be more effective. So uh, I put 150 crores uh, of my personal wealth into Arkia, and over 12 years we have been able to disperse 145 crores um, into about 145 projects, and we have a footprint in about 22 states, and I hope that will grow. And we think we have directly affected 50 lakh people, but indirectly it's hard to tell because as we discuss the work, you'll see why. And um, over the last few years, we have started focusing much more on groundwork. Um, so here you are with this you know, visible issue. How did you decide to go invisible? What is it that made, brought you to groundwater? So as, our, as we started knowing our partners' work better spread across many of the drier regions of this country, we realized that while the government has spent, and this is one estimate I read, 400,000 crores over the last several decades on surface water, the fact is that India is actually using groundwater. 35 million bore wells and spread around the country, and while we are building the irrigation infrastructure with surface water, talking about rivers, people are drawing up water from the ground. And so unless we are able to make that invisible water visible, there is no way it can be used sustainably or equitably. And that's what's happening. India is drawing more groundwater than America and China. And uh, uh, you can see if you look at the satellite map. So it's truly shocking what's happening to the groundwater levels, especially in some parts of the country. 
So we have to make the invisible water visible and allow, use good science, use good data, and use society's own ability to innovate to, to help us all uh, manage our groundwater better. Because otherwise, we are already in crisis. But Cape Town, which is going to declare itself yeah. as uh, day zero on April, will look like a picnic compared to what happened to India. Just look at the numbers of people that get affected. Yeah, I mean, we have, um, it's, Water Aid has estimated that 80% of our water is, is, you know, that we get is um, contaminated due to untreated sewage. We have uh, half our wells decreasing, you know, the water table in yes. half our wells is decreasing. And we have um, almost 300, I think the, the estimate in 2016 was that uh, almost 300 million people living in kind of uh, conditions that are drought affected, yes. you know, uh, in, 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 in various ways and to various conditions. So these are very palpable effects of uh, not thinking in that uh, integrated way. Yes, right. yeah. um, also in a city like ours in Mumbai, when we don't, in our daily basis, especially if you're from South Bombay or you're from now the growing, more prosperous areas, have a daily crisis or a battle with water. Yeah, really all of you here in this room, if you're living in Bombay, and I, I grew up in Mumbai, and uh, we never really had a water problem. There's not like so much water, but there, were, there was water flowing out of taps. It seems like a miracle still to millions and millions of people in this country in 2018. So, uh, and uh, while of course the slums of Bombay uh, yes. were not represented here, we not have the same thing to say. But even if you move from Mumbai to Bangalore, the situation changes. I remember when we went to Bangalore first, we had to fight literally like the movies, you know, they show. The tanker would come and all of us would have in, in India's favorite national dress, which is the 90, the women, the women would come <laughs> rushing out with their buckets, their kids, and it would be a mela. I mean, today the situation is not that different in many parts. Yeah, absolutely. There are two interesting new studies come out, uh, you know, uh, Pipe Politics and Hydraulic City. Two books that I was asked to review, the ethnographies of Mumbai with this kind of um, with a system that is very different in, in low income areas, you know, right. compared to the ones that we live in. Nonetheless, one of the things is not only the income segregation within the city and access to water, but the fact that those of us who have water and enjoy it are also part of the depletion of the groundwater cycle and the circle, you know, and that is something where we are not thinking about so seriously because it's out there, right? I mean, that's so the relationship to the urban and the rural, I think, is very, very important to make groundwater visible yes. um, as consumers of water. If yes. any, you know, we are inevitably drawing on groundwater, right? Um, inevitably. And contaminating. Every use we do of water contaminated. Um, and we just don't look at waste streams. You can do Swachh Bharat and build as many toilets as you want, but if you don't look at the waste streams, actually are going to make people's public health issues worse than if you didn't have toilets. Now that's a really serious thing to say. Yeah. But uh, in areas where so-called sustainable open defecation used to happen in the sense that, and I'm not promoting open defecation, so don't get me wrong, but if you don't watch out for what you're doing, where your groundwater tables and your uh, toilet stream, waste streams are meeting, we have done some research, we have commissioned a lot of research on the groundwater uh, sanitation nexus in India. We are finding that the contamination is going straight into the groundwater which then you are pulling up to drink. So earlier when people, the communities were doing uh, open defecation because they didn't have toilets in every home, there were some social protocols followed as to where to go. Now all that, if you, I, I can show you hundreds of pictures of toilets next to the well. and. Uh, Nitrate contamination, which I'm just reading more about, is going to be one of the emerging as as with the problem is global warming. I didn't even know that, and that's got a lot to do with how we use groundwater. Yeah. So in this, um, I, I want to come back to Argyam and uh, the, the interventions that you were trying to make with Argyam in this very very mammoth problem. Yeah. Even bringing it to the fore, bringing it to the surface. Um, you started off with two flagship programs. I mean, uh, yes. one of them is India Water Portal. Yes. So, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, the National Knowledge Commission at the time that was instituted uh, wanted to create uh, portals for the whole country to serve as knowledge resources uh, in different sectors. And Argyam offered to start the India Water Portal and fund it. 
it's now 10 years and uh, uh, it's been, you know, the thing on the India water bottle, it's used a lot by researchers. It's not really designed for citizens to just go there and learn how to manage water. It's more for uh, the research community. But of course, many others use it too. And the Hindi water bottle has reached out massively to citizens and takes up really ideological battles on water. But um, we thought we certainly needed a sort of one-stop shop where data and stories came together. And that's what we've been doing. Uh, it was born in an era when all today's fancy digital technologies have not yet converged. If India Water Bottle was born today, it would have a very different, uh, a very different uh, sort of imagination. And we are trying to see in earlier version for how we can make that a little more exciting. It serves the vital purpose, I think, to the, all many researchers have come and told us that thank you for still running that. And there have been some nice stories where people have read something and gone and approached the government and got local problems solved. So any such knowledge platform which is fairly open. Um, I think is an important resource in the community. Yeah, I mean, you've been a journalist, uh, you know, and uh, looking at media and media coverage of water, there's very little space uh, for developmental issues as we know. So, um, so the challenge then is to have the alternative media as yes. the water portal is one form of that and make it you know, if, if, and then it's make it out there, you know. And in fact, a lot of, uh, our, a lot of material from the India Water Bottle does land up in mainstream media because it's, we are giving it free, it's open, and we encourage it. We build a lot of relationship with media houses to do that. Because they're not investing the money for the reporters to go and collect the stories. I see. So it's going to dip into the portal. Yeah. But that's but, fine. I mean, so long as people are able to read it. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, as, as I mean for us also when we are working on water, no matter what academic knowledge exists, when we look at India Water Portal, it does multiple things. It does the academic part, it has other studies, uh, you know, and I think that's very challenging. And, and, and yet it's presenting it in a very translatable manner and, um, you know, it's been uh, just, I remember when it came out, it was such a buzz because such a, it was a very interesting imagination putting data out there and making it accessible. So I think that continues to be a very, very valuable resource. And then the second flagship program, which is participatory water you know, governance from the yeah, public. So um, why participatory and uh, why the focus on governance? Right. So we have, uh, what, uh, through our partners, we have developed a sort of uh, uh, a platform called the Participatory Groundwater uh, Management Program. And, uh, I think participation matters a lot because water is local, local, local as a political issue. And if you don't have the participation, you're immediately going to get into issues of uh, you know water not being distributed equally. Mm -hmm. I mean, people see in India we have no regulation. I'm sure many of you know this. Sorry if y'all are already experts in water because you've been attending the series. And I know Vina and Imansh and others have talked here before me. But we are one of the most poorly regulated groundwater regimes in the world. And uh, because of uh, an old act from 1882 called the Easement Act, which basically the British created to say that the water beneath your feet is yours. So technically I can dig a hole and suck up a whole aquifer and sell it. And uh, of course, somebody might catch me. But legally there is still no framework to stop me. And uh, so that means that when groundwater is a common pool resource, you have to create participatory mechanisms to manage it sustainably. Otherwise, partly because we don't have regulation, partly because we have no proper institutional structures to manage groundwater, there is no alternative. So in the absence of good policy and regulation, we have to push through the community and make a sort of a, a de facto, if not de jure, model way of uh, managing groundwater. For us, participation was a very key philosophical form. And so it's called the Participatory Groundwater Management Program, which is now, we have directly funded about 500 installations in the sense that uh, uh, our hydrogeological experts and others go into these communities where there is a problem. They help those communities to make their invisible water meaning their faith visible by using data, uh, data practices and good science and train people then to understand and budget for their water. And there are many mechanisms that people use. They, um, they segregate some bore wells for lifeline water 
so that at least that is taken care of. They do crop rotation or crop, better crop management. And they find it takes time, because there are no shortcuts in this. It takes time, but after two years, uh, the community realizes that by sharing that finite resource under their feet, actually they've shown that income's going up, because they're rationalizing what they're putting, what crops they're putting into the ground. And uh, so we are very encouraged with this, and we have done a lot of input into policy. And there is, there is a lot of talk, but I'm sorry it's not yet come to ground, so I hope a new program called the Atal uh, Bhujal Yojana, which has been floundering for a couple of years, but was mentioned in the budget where a billion dollars will be going into groundwater management. I hope some of these principles that our partners have been working on for eight years um, will get embedded and scaled. When you say participatory and community governance uh, um, and management, how do you how do you make sure that it's truly participatory going on? Do you have a, like a how does gender, for example, get into it? Yeah, I must say that I mean I'm not visited every site obviously, but uh, we have done a deep dive now into all all the locations to say what's emerging, and I can say it's not a perfect process as it is. You know, we are a deeply structured hierarchical society, so it's very hard to create real participatory processes. Okay, to to call out women's voices. Um, takes very special effort to call out Dalit voices, to call out you know other voices in water. It's it's still strangely we are still strangely stuck in some 300 year old kind of ideas of society. So it has to be done very actively. And I must say it succeeds sometimes and it doesn't sometimes because when the when the NGO leaves, sometimes there's a slip back. Uh, because power structures are so deeply in it's very hard to battle them. But, uh, you know, once your mind is opened up to an idea, it's very hard to shut it. So, once people have seen the participatory processes, they have seen that they do try to keep them going. Because they have seen that then they get access to water, those who are left out. So, I think participation is such a powerful idea that it's hard to roll back once the toothpaste has come out of the tube. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that... Um, you know, when you're looking at participation, and you're looking at very grounded community level action, right? So even in the interventions that you've made, and I know um, one of the areas is spring water. Yes. So in those interventions, the, the how has that linked to the participatory action of the community yeah. in reviving spring water or springs, you know, or in maximizing their output, or how has that worked? So actually the springs has been really easier to ask me because um, springs, uh, India, nobody knows how many springs there are in India and springs are so important because they feed our rivers and uh, you know they have got neglected because of uh, land use change, because of uh, you know pipe water supply, because of so many things but our mountainous areas depend on spring water, many many communities still depend on spring water for uh, their lifeline water and uh, it's also ground water which by the way the government did not acknowledge it fairly recently it was not considered groundwater. Uh, and it, it took all our partners a lot of work and effort to say that no, actually this groundwater is just coming out because it's in a discharge zone. <laughs> and now it's become it's been called groundwater. This was uh, quite stunning to know. And so we have taken up this work in about six, twelve states with our partners, and so far we have been able to rejuvenate seven thousand springs. Springs is easy because those people really, there is no other water. You really depend on that source and if you don't look after it, you don't get water. It's as simple as that. So it has been easier to put in those social protocols, say don't spoil, don't dirty the area around that water, manage the ca catchment a little better. Um, there are upstream, downstream issues there and uh, some protocols have been set up for that as well. In fact, that has been successful. Six states now want to work with us to map all their streams and uh, and revive all of them and keep them going in the northeast um, and in the western parts as well. So uh, hopefully this program will scale and I'll talk to you a little more about how that might happen. Okay, just on uh, springs too. I mean, what about like local knowledge and indigenous systems of monitoring yeah. that were um, you know different? I mean, or, I'm not saying that they should persist in the same way in the 21st century, but <laughs> nonetheless. There was a local, lot of local wisdom and very jealously guarded 
uh, rules and taboos around springs and um, I, I certainly experienced that in my work in Ladakh, which is a very dry land area and agriculture really depends on water. Where, um, you know, it was this, the area around the springs was uh, considered the place where the Lu or the Nagas lived. So you, if, you, if you violated that, you were tabooing that ground. So, in, so spring water was, you know, so the spring itself and the area around it could not be contaminated. And that was, and this was guarded through a system of governance by these chutpons or people who were called chiefs of the water that were elected. And that they not only guarded the springs, but they also looked at the, the, the channels that were built, built for irrigation and they ensured that water was distributed fairly and equitably, otherwise they would have mediated the fights. So I'm just wondering, are you, in, in, in the work that you're doing, is there um, a, 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 an indigenous wisdom that is also, uh, you know, something that is worth Yeah, with? I think whenever such practices have made water places sacred, uh, they have remained, uh, 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 you know, or non-contaminated. But I must say, in whatever little, I mean, it's a recent program, I haven't been able to, for various personal reasons, travel so much to see our springs work in the Northeast. But uh, what we are hearing is those practices are getting a little disrupted. Uh, there is not enough continuity of moral leadership. And so we have to reimagine them. And that's the new challenge we are facing. How do you reimagine the sacredness? How do you value water in 2018? How do you create a new grammar of sacredness for water? And um, I think some of our partners do struggle with that. Yeah. yeah, the sacred is also the exclusive, you know, as you pointed out earlier, you know, who has uh, the tattoos associated with it for women, for Dalits, you know, are again, so the sacred can go into either domain. And so how do you create an inclusive sacredness? I think that's a huge challenge for our democracy. Uh, you know. <laughs> um, one of the interesting, you know, uh, roles that Artyom has played has also been a, a space where research is nurtured and research is, you know, supported. Um, why, why research when so many philanthropists, uh, you know, 12 years ago when we started, were not looking, were looking at research is not. Action is important, research is anyway happening somewhere if it matters. So uh, will you tell me how you um, how you support research and wh why has that been an important part of your practice? Yeah, I think we see ourselves as long-term players, right? We're not going away. And the more you do uh, physical projects, the more you know that if you're not able to connect the dots, your physical projects are not going to be successful. To do that, you need long-term study, you need good data, you need academicians to come in and stay the course to give real usable knowledge. And so we have been supporting research in various ways. We tend to have a bias towards action research. So uh, a lot of our uh, work is, you know, collect the knowledge but try out something. So do, think, do, and produce the data. So that's how we work and we will continue to do that. And, uh, uh, maybe it's a great time to talk now about what Algem has done all this for 12 years and we think if we continue this, we will do incremental things and be successful and in fact real people's lives in a positive way. But when you look at the problem of India and the sheer scale at which the solutioning needs to happen, uh, we'll just be a drop in the ocean. And I think it's not even about money. You know, today there is so much philanthropic capital all dressed up with all nowhere to go that you actually need to create the pipelines for which, in which this philanthropic capital can come in into the water sector in a smart and strategic way. So we are hoping, and uh, this is not really for so much publishing, but just to share with you that in our next version, we hope to move from partnerships to platforms. And we hope to be able to design uh, a digital platform, shareable infrastructure for lots of actors to be able to work on top of that. And we hope that scale will come through that rather than Albion trying to go to new locations all the time. So that's under design. It's come out of the work that um, Nandan and I have been doing over the last several uh, couple of decades at least. My work in Pratham Books where we created a free platform for people to write, read, publish, print, share, etc., illustrate, etc. And we have been able to reach tens of millions of kids through that digital open platform. And uh, so we knew that you have to create something that is designed for scale, 
that is open, shareable, and that allows co-creation on top of it and collaboration. Similarly, of course, Nandan Swami and Aadhaar is at a population scale, and so designing platforms at that level, we brought both those ideas into something called Eight Step, which Nandan and I started two and a half years ago, which is a digital learning platform for young children. Um, we hope to reach uh, 200 million children in the next five years with more access to learning opportunities. So we took that same framework and we are calling it societal platforms. And in Albion, we are hoping to build that out uh, in the next two years. So could you, what, what put something on that platform? Right, so like? we talk to all our partners, how can we help you? We don't want to keep on doing the same thing because we know we're just doing The constant need that we heard was, we need to have better data and research. We need to be able to train a lot of people rapidly. And we need to make scarce training resources unscarce. Because, for example, our, my friend Himanshu Kulkarni desperately needs to be cloned. Because there's just this one Himanshu who goes from space to space in trying to solve the groundwater problem of this country. But so, how do you look at, say, this scarce resource? How do you design it to become unscarce? What do you need to do? And of course, uh, they, they wanted uh, a feedback systems, monitoring and evaluation, which is where you know data for that almost comes out as an exhaust, not as a very time-intensive activity done repeatedly. It should. So how do you design for something like that? And that's where Algium is going to go into a very a zone where completely out of our comfort zone, where we are going to take more responsibility internally rather than saying we are a funder and who was up the way, I'm going to so now we are going to have to say we are doing uh, the we have to take more responsibility and go into technology, which is unfortunately not my forte. So they're going to have a huge culture shift. But I do hope that uh, we can build something that's useful for all that we have heard for data and research, for uh, capacity building and training, for deployment tools for better deployment, and then of course to refine it by getting back uh, data on how it works. Yeah, I mean, that's wonderful to hear. Obviously, that's very sympathetic to, the, to what we are aiming to do as well. And uh, I, I think in this framework, it would be great because you have um, you know, great partners with think tanks, you have partners with community-based action groups, you have, uh, but I, I feel like the academic community, the network of universities, and the, the, the young people they train, the investments that they are now beginning to make in research, and bringing research into a into a way that matters uh, both in terms of long term, which is important, but also action research. I feel like there's a good opportunity, perhaps, to partner with institutions that have been age old, but also can't just be the same shells, but also need to transform. So um, perhaps some of the challenges that you spoke of with partners, uh, or even with someone like Himanshu, you know, really was just incredible. He spoke here. Some of you heard him. And um, I wonder, uh, uh, Roini, if that would be um, something that you would more actively engage with, with yeah. universities. So, yeah. the, so on the platform, there will have to be uh, some way for the knowledge that universities are producing to be pooled for discoverability. Otherwise, many times universities act in silos, I'm sorry to say. No. And uh, <laughs> uh, if you, even if you go to one IIT and say, uh, you know, have you seen what this other IIT has done? They say, have you seen what we have done? You know? <laughs> so how do you break down this, uh, we are the best in the world, and how do we create? So I think that has to be again done by designing something on a platform where when you put something out there, it aggregates knowledge publicly. And so I hope that will be one of the focus areas where you have to give us some time. Yeah. I think that uh, a lot of, uh, it's not only an entire university representing itself, it's departments within that that are signed. Yeah, you know, right. say for the ideologists on one end, for the social scientists, and nobody is talking to each other necessarily. Yeah. So I think when the university exceeds its own boundedness, it offers a very good space because it is it does have institutional longevity. It does have next generation people uh, clamoring for training and clamoring and hungry to do something that makes a difference. And we were able to see that, observe that firsthand when we had the Ganges exhibition, where um, just from school children to um, you know people from architecture, engineering, they weren't interested, they were doing those schools, but they were interested in talking about it as an issue. And you know, and I think, and- No, it's great that y'all have, you know, you're going to be a resource center.
those students and citizens on some of these areas, and of course, what is after my heart, so what you did with the reverse execution. Uh, I applaud you for that. So you're coming to back yourself. Yes, yeah. absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Just going back to the research zone, I know, can you just give us an example, because not everybody is from academia, of one like large scale research study you did and how it translated to anything on the ground that either informed any yeah. Yeah. So, uh, this was not really an academic study, but uh, I'm taking you back to a uh, a very large uh, uh, survey we did, household survey of water and sanitation. Um, I got it, it was so far back, and it was called Ashwas. And it was one of the largest, that's some 18,000 households, wow. where we mapped, uh, where we had a, a, a research team go out there and a, a, a survey team go out there and map what's happening to the water and sanitation thing. And of course the results were shocking. Um, but uh, about access, about pollution, about uh, lack of source sustainability, um, lack of soil, and the whole thing, as you can imagine. But from that, what we did was um, we compiled the research and shared it widely, of course. After that, uh, we were able to go back to 126 gram panchayats and say, look, here's your report, report card back to you. Now, do you want help to make a five year action plan and set your own goal to say, we are here now, we want to be here in five years? And that process went through for about a couple of years. I think it's time to go back and find out what happened. But that's one example. The other thing is we are working with six universities in India on the groundwater uh, sanitation nexus. And some of them have come back with early results, but we will be publishing all those together very shortly. So that's the other thing. And then, of course, all the hydrogeological research done by our partners is being put out in journals. All right, thank you. Um, Rohini, so you've got a lot of passion and you've got a lot of, you've charted what is effective, what is not effective for yourself and you're, it seems like you're constantly evaluating yourself, right? Is that a very important part of being a philanthropic organization? Being able to admit, it's a risk. And uh, when I was at the Port Foundation, people are always said, uh, you know, often when I would talk to people outside the developmental sector, when I, but NGOs, right? Many of you have also said that. They're not effective. What is they're just going to waste all the money? They're going to not do anything. It is a scam, and we know that that's not. And if you trusted a sector for all its difficulties, you trusted the sector. So it's about trusting and taking risks, and also evaluating yourselves. Is that how you measure your own effectiveness? How do you measure that when you look at the mammoth problem out there? As you said, the drop in the ocean you're trying to make. What keeps you going and you know what? how do you measure that you're on this path and that's your next step and you need to keep going there? Right. So uh, I think the question of trust is very important. See, and I've you know a lot of business people who are now being forced to do CSR because of the new law and become more philanthropic because rich people are being forced to be much more philanthropic because Nowadays, you can't have a, a, a Ferrari without owning a foundation. So in the sense that public and business are saying, what are you wealthy people doing with all your wealth? So they're learning fast. And I don't want to be mean, but they're getting excited too, because they find it's probably easier to run a company than it is to run a foundation. And it's very hard to make social change. So when they put their own feet in the water, as I did too, uh, we learn very fast. But the first thing you have to have is trust. So the markets operate in a very different way from uh, uh, from the Samaj sector, right? And so trust is a very important thing. I think we need to start with trust saying, ah, you know what, we have a common goal, I trust you to, to do your work. And without that, you will you will not succeed. So for us, that's a very important part of how we deal with those who we give money and other stuff to. Um, and uh, that's the currency really of the social sector. You cannot do good work without that. Uh, the second thing is what keeps us uh, going, going. Of course, we do some measurements. Uh, we are not uh, crazy about measuring everything because we believe that some of the most important work that we have actually done is not measurable because it has uh, the work our partners have done is to enable communities to say we are part of the solution, not part of the problem alone. And how do you measure that? How do you measure that self-esteem that people get from examining? a problem deeply and trying to find solutions and hanging in there. Uh, I don't know how to measure that. I can measure wells, I can measure how much water people got, I, and that we do. But it is 
it is that feedback which comes that when we have not succeeded in say reaching the last um, uh, hamlet in a particular panchayat, that kind of feedback which comes allows us to say, but what are we doing? Uh, what should we be doing more? And that's how we move from this project to programs and then more structured partnerships and hopefully platform which will allow more scale and more data on effectiveness to come back. And what keeps us going? I mean, in India, if you wake up in the morning, there's only wonderful million challenges to solve. And they're part of solving that uh, very exciting. Any area you take, any area whatsoever that you're interested in, whether it's street dogs or water or nutrition, well, there's never a dull moment because there's so much to do. Yeah, I think that's uh, really, and, and the ability to, to, and the challenge of scale, even if for something that is, uh, for us, a very small area, is our almost, or our city is entire country elsewhere. So I think it's both a challenge yeah. as well as a dedication to, uh, to no, knowing how to solve that. Um, and I think it's a very important role India can play uh, as it raises global, you know, as it's part of a global context. We can learn certainly from a lot of small countries and a lot of small interventions. Um, uh, Southeast Asia, so much experimentation can happen in countries like Vietnam and so many other places, Cambodia. But uh, to your point, uh, Ravina, I think uh, while there's a lot to learn from other countries that have obviously managed their water better, I think it is true that no country has faced the kind of challenges that India has at a cusp when we can no longer dump our waste somewhere else. And when climate change is already upon us, and how, how do we rethink water management in that context? We can learn from others, but we have to become an innovation lab ourselves. And we have to be able to experiment. We have to be able to create, I think, decentralized, flexible, resilient structures of water management. And no country has had to do that in such a hurry as we have to. So yeah. in that sense, I think while we can learn a lot, I think we have to start experimenting and innovating here locally also. Yeah. And it's already upon us. 500 million people in this country, that's a lot of people, are at risk of some water contamination every day as we speak. And we run two uh, water quality networks, one for arsenic and uh, we run the secretary, we fund the secretariat uh, on fluoride and arsenic and it's an action research network and there are many partners, many states involved but uh, you know we have to go, we have started three years ago, we have reached a few million people but the size of the problem is 500, how do you move the needle on that? People are dying of arsenic poisoning, people are getting new contaminants in the water which I have never heard of before. How do you rapidly scale up for the discovery of the problem and then a palette of solutions? Really, when you, um, you know, being who you are, being, being um, wealthy, being passionate, and then you have a slew of partners who are working with you. How do you make room for debate and dissent? In yeah. Well, yeah, it's a very good <coughs> question. Uh, I think you should ask our partners because I have most But we really, we really try to listen. And uh, uh, I don't know about dissent because everything we do is co-created. It's not like Algam is sitting there and saying, you know, we have the solutions for all the world's water problems. You better listen to us. Here's the money. Go to ABC. We never do that. We never do that. Somebody comes to us and says, look. I know what my community's problems are, or the state level issues are, or what policy and advocacy needs to be done, can you help us? And all the time, in any of the design, it is cooperation. There is nothing we are imposing, so therefore dissent becomes a little more difficult to do. <laughs> and, uh, but feedback, they are quite honest with their feedback, and they are quite honest in listening. Okay, uh, but that's within. What if, um, I guess, how you solve something, right? how you come to a solution, well, because it's also social, as much as it's economic or uh, governance oriented, we'll have, uh, you could do the same thing in different ways and you choose a vantage point. So I, how do you create a healthy community with other philanthropists or other, you know, of, of debate? So with other philanthropists, to answer your question, there are people who used to be opposed to some stuff that RPM was doing because they thought uh, there are some, uh, misconceptions if they would come to our office and we would say please come here's what we are trying to do if you have any new ideas uh, we are happy to look at them uh, they thought for some reason that we were influencing uh, uh, money from the bank or some world bank or something which we were not trying to do and we were able to sit across the table
table and said, that's not what we are trying to do. We are trying to impact decentralized options. And in the recent past, I have not seen anybody come. But talking about other philanthropists, I think there's a lot of interest in funding water stuff now. And uh, uh, Ravina, we all probably should do the research to find out how much is getting invested by so many corporations now on water because it's a, such an obvious crisis. And um, we, we, did, we have something called the India Philanthropy Initiative, where a lot of uh, uh, the wealthy who want to uh, engage in discussions on philanthropy come together. And we do a lot of thematics every year to help people understand the sector deeply and see opportunities for investing philanthropically in that sector. So water one is planned, the sanitation one was done. And so we are talking to each other now, and the CSR people are talking separately also to each other, and also commonly to learn from each other. Yeah. And uh, when one philanthropist goes in there and achieves some success and builds some trust, a lot of people will follow, because then they don't have to invest that upfront money to discover and trust. So uh, we have been able to pull in a lot of CSR and other philanthropic funding in our projects by taking initial risks and being the first movers in that space, and then other people have followed. Um, so if you had to give, um, you know, from your learning and from your experience now, being a philanthropist, having a foundation, um, if you had to look at CSR, you know, the CSR framework, uh, what would be two or three key learnings you could share with the new CSRs? You know, because a lot of people are, you know, would come to us when I was at Ford and say, how did you do it? You know, and sometimes they, all they needed to do was systems of accounting, organization, HR, and sometimes it was the ideating, you know, and um, we talked to Hari when he came. So it was ideating systems. So where do you feel Aryam can play that role as a leader? So we, people do come to us a lot to say, well, where should we work in water? The CSR law is a bad law, I'm sorry to say, because, uh, um, I mean, I'm trying to make the best of a bad law, but it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think it's outsourcing governance and business businesses are not geared to do the work that foundations and civil society actors can do. Plus the law is very constraining. It says you can do this, you can do this. And things that they used to do before also they are not doing because now they are channeled and build toilets. We get a message with so many toilets. <coughs> and if you were to say, I don't want to build toilets, I want to look at the waste streams then that's not really the core competence of uh, foundation. So then they land up doing things that are visible, that uh, seem to have quick impact, that are not necessarily strategic, not all of them. Some people who have, some uh, country, companies in this country have been deeply philanthropic for a very long time, but I'm talking about those who have suddenly had to. So now there's a culture shift that has to be made in the corporate sector that you have to take this work seriously too, which means they have to build the talent inside and the ability to think long term. The ability to think long term and again, uh, we are trying to say look at groundwater. <coughs> Don't look just at surface water and toilets. Uh, look at groundwater and see if we can do some pooled stuff together. But uh, it may take some time. Uh, I'm going to end with uh, something I read that in an interview that you did with Forbes, where you talked about um, wealth generation and you compared it to, you said it should be like a river that flows rather than something that's dammed. Yeah. And I thought that was very powerful um, uh, and, and telling of your own philosophy. Thank you so much, Roman. That was like a marathon session. I think yeah, I can't believe that you got uh, so much. I mean, you gave us so many ideas and so much to think about and covered such. Uh, you know, with such depth, uh, you know, the issues that we put forward to you. So thank you for coming and thanks you and we, please, we will be staying engaged with you and I know that there's a lot of um, anxiousness and there's a to know and to learn, to share and to do. So thank, thank you everyone for such a great audience mm -hmm. and uh, you know, water affects every single one of us. So keeping on that learning journey is so important and you all showed uh, this sort of fabulous audience here. Thank you so much and thank you. Thank you.